You may be seated. Uh, when Kurt made that announcement concerning the uh, uh, pies, I, I've been thinking ever since last night when he made that announcement of what kind of pie I'm going to make. And I'm sure it'll go for a high price, uh, even though I've never made a pie before. <laughs> so uh, maybe I could, uh, maybe I could, uh, yeah, if it had caramel popcorn, that would be good. Uh, that might be, that's a good idea. Yeah, I'll bet that would go for a lot of money. Um, but uh, that it's exciting what's going on. I, I know there are some people from the church, uh, three people going from the church to uh, the Czech Republic this summer. Uh, Don is thinking of doing a, a trip to uh, Guatemala uh, uh, and taking some people along with him and also these nine individuals plus a couple of uh, adults that are going to be headed toward uh, you know, toward Ireland, and it's, it's so great that we can reach out with Jesus' love to other people uh, all around the world. It just is amazing to me when I hear of our missionaries uh, that we support. It's just, uh, it's wonderful how God is choosing to use us in uh, people's lives, not only from the, in the United States, but, but everywhere. So, um, if you would turn in your Bibles with me this morning to Mark chapter 14, and while you're turning, turning there, I just want to let you know that the Galatians study, we just had our first meeting this past Tuesday night. There are five more weeks before Easter, and then we're going to take a couple of week break, and then we have four more weeks then. So it's a total of 10 weeks, but uh, it is, it, Galatians is really good. It's just a letter that's written by the Apostle Paul, and he's, he's just ex, he's explaining to people who have been misled by legalistic um, individuals, religious people. He, he is explaining uh, how, why the law has nothing to do with how we get right with God and nothing to do with how we walk right with God. The law has a purpose. It has a role. But it's not the way to walk and it's not the way to get right with God. So if you'd like to join us on Tuesday night at 6.30 in the back room, we'd, we'd love to have you join us. If you need babysitting, be sure you sign up back there. There are already some people that are bringing their children. So, But we'd love to have you um, join us on Tuesday night if, if you desire to do that. I realize there are a lot of wonderful things that are, a lot of wonderful lessons that are being uh, taught here at the church and a lot of good ministries that are getting us involved in the Word. And this is just another one of those. Uh, how many of you, uh, let's just let me ask you this question before we pray, uh, and so this will require you to be honest, because we're going to pray, uh, but how many of you like tests? Uh, let's see, there's one, two, okay, two liars, and let's see, oh, there's three, three, yeah. <laughs> Well, Lord, we pray today that as we see it's testing time, that we would uh, be honest before you and learn what you are using these tests to accomplish. Sometimes our tests show us we're doing really well and that we're resting in you and trusting you and we're following your will. Other times we see that we've really missed the mark and we're not, uh, we, we are not resting in you in a particular area or a particular choice that we're making. So, Lord, may you... Uh, May you use this uh, time of examining these people in Scripture uh, to also let you examine our own lives and show us these areas that need uh, we need to pay attention to them because they're, they're, we're not walking right before you. So thanks for each person who's here this morning. It's exciting to uh, just share some time together. We realize there are some schools that are off right now, and uh, so there's some people gone, but uh, we thank you that... We could gather together this morning, and may you use these words, these words from your word, uh, to uh, really, really uh, reveal what needs to be dealt with, and uh, how secure we are in your love. And we thank you in Jesus' name, Amen. Uh, if you uh, if you think tests uh, stop when you get out of school, uh, you're wrong. Um, Tests are, at least they should be, designed to reveal what you know and whether you've prepared. It's to reveal what you don't know. Um, and one of the things that you've probably found in life, and it's, it's true in school, but it's also true in life, that tests uh, uh, 
as you grow, the tests become harder. Um, and in many ways, they should be. If, if your test is always in the same area, uh, perhaps you're not growing. If the same test, you know, you're given the same test today as you had five years ago or ten years ago, and it's still a really a struggle for you, perhaps uh, you're not growing. Uh, maybe God is using that to reveal that. But, you know, you, you don't give a freshman in high school a, a second grade test because that's not where they are anymore. At least it's not where they should be anymore. Okay? And, and I, I truly believe that as a Christian grows, I think the tests do become harder. I think the tests that, that Mary Lee, my wife and I, we face, I think are harder um, in, in these years than they were 10 years ago or 20 or 30. Um, uh, doesn't mean we weren't tested during that time. It just means uh, they're kind of appropriate for where we are in our walk with the Lord. So if you aren't prepared, it's revealed on the test. I, I had an economics test in college that I didn't prepare for. Um, I, um, I, I didn't like the subject. I didn't understand the subject. Uh, I'm sure it was the teacher's fault. Uh, but uh, I was far too interested in basketball, so I, uh, for this one test, I did not study, and it was, and my, my hope was that it was true-false, and I thought, certainly, I can get 60%, three out of five, right, I can guess those right, just using my rational abilities that I have. So I took that test, and uh, I didn't even get half of them right. This is a guessing thing. I could have put true on all of them. You know, I, I mean, uh, and um, my score revealed my lack of preparation. And thank goodness that teacher liked our basketball team. <laughs> That's all I can say for that particular, uh, that particular class. Man. Lack of preparation. We looked at it with Jesus when he... Uh, uh, when he had the opportunity to prepare in the Garden of Gethsemane and how he prepared. He, he stayed alert. He was watching and he was praying. He was spending time with his father and listening to his voice. He was figuring out, Father, this is, I'm just coming because I'm dependent upon you and I want to know your will in this situation, and that's what I want more than I even want my own will. And so, Father, your will be done. But you also had several other people who were being tested at that same time. And they were the apostles. There were 11 of them now. Uh, Judas Iscariot had gone to make preparations to betray Jesus that very night within this, right after this time of prayer. But the, these other apostles were there, and they did not stay awake. They did not pray. They slept. They did not use their preparation time, and when the test came, which they're going to come, whether we're prepared or not, when the test came, they flunked. They didn't do well. I think that uh, a lack of preparation shows up. I think that the tests get harder as the years go by. I also think that God uses those tests in our lives to reveal those areas where we are resting in him and where we aren't. And so as we look at this passage today, I have an opening question on your handout if you're following along with that. But after a time when we could have, should have been praying, the test come to see whether what we have or should have learned. And so if you look at Mark chapter 14, verse 41, it says, And Jesus came a third time, this is to the three apostles, and they've been sleeping while he's been praying. And he came the third time and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? It's enough. The hour has come. Listen, the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up. Let us be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. 
And so we ask ourselves the question, what would I have done, what would you have done if you had been with Jesus in the garden on that dark night? It's probably after midnight. And we're going to see Judas betray Jesus. We're going to see Peter draw a sword and try to cut off somebody's head. We see the disciples would flee for their lives when they had the opportunity. And there's also a young man who would escape into the night. And the question becomes, would have you have responded like Judas or Peter or like Jesus or the disciples or this unknown young man? And the fact that we're going to see as we continue in this study over the coming weeks is that Jesus would give his life for every one of those individuals, including us. Even if we flunk the test, Jesus would give his life for you and me and even his betrayer. It's an amazing thing. Jesus was the only person who responded well, pleasing to the Father in the midst of this test. Look at verse 43 with me, and we're going to read through uh, verse 52. Immediately while he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up and accompanied by a crowd of, of by a crowd with swords and clubs, who were from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Those are the religious leaders of, of the Jews. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one, seize him and lead him away under guard. After coming, Judas immediately went to him, saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. They laid hands on him and seized him, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a, a robber or an insurrectionist? More kind of like a, more maybe even a terrorist. Every day I was with you in the temple teaching and you did not seize me. But this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. And they all left him and fled. A young man was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. And they seized him, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. This is known as the first streaker. Um, so... That, that's what was, we're going to see all that take place here. But these are test times for each of these individuals, Judas and Peter and Jesus and the, the disciples and this young man. And test time comes for Judas in verses 43 and 44. Immediately while Jesus was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, came up accompanied by a crowd with swords and clubs who were with him from the chief priests and the scribes and the elders. Now he who was betraying him had given them a signal saying, whomever I kiss, he's the one, seize him and lead him away under, under guard. And after coming, or after coming Jesus, Judas immediately went to Jesus saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. Test time for Judas. It's an amazing phrase when it, he makes, that, that the writer makes clear, this is one of the twelve. This is one of those people that Jesus chose to be an apostle. One, he wanted him to be his messenger. Uh, this man spent day in and day out hearing Jesus and spending time with him and interacting with Jesus and the rest of the disciples and, and watching the, the works of, of miracles. In fact, he had actually even gone out and, and done miracles in Jesus' name. But that night he came to the Garden of Gethsemane with a crowd of Roman soldiers. In fact, if you read John's gospel referring to the same event, you realize there are hundreds of soldiers. This isn't just a little, little squadron of people of four or five individuals sent to arrest Jesus. These are, there are hundreds of people here and there are also the, the temple police armed with clubs. And we don't know the motive. I know sometimes, you know, when things take place that we don't understand, we always want to, what was the motive behind this? Uh, you, you, we don't know the motive here. Uh, perhaps he was disappointed that Jesus didn't meet his expectations. Jesus, I told you how you should answer this or how you should act in this situation, and you didn't do it. So I'm disappointed in you. 
How often do we pray that way and then say, God, this is, I had somebody talk to me afterwards. She said, I, I'm kind of slowing down on praying anymore because God doesn't do what I want him to do. <laughs> she had a twinkle in her eye and a smile on her face as she said that because I know her and she's a, a godly woman. Perhaps he was trying to spur Jesus into action. You know, they had claimed that Jesus was the Christ, and Jesus accepted that. He was the Jewish Messiah. He was the king who had been talked about in the Old Testament that was coming. And, and you know, come on, whatever it will take to spur you into action so that you can conquer the Romans, we can be set free from our slavery to them. We don't know the motive, but we do see the action. In many ways, we did, it doesn't matter what the motive was because the action revealed that he was betraying Jesus. But Judas that night knew where Jesus was and was aware that Jesus' disciples might fight. And so here's this show of force this, and this triple alliance of the, you know, the, the chief priests and the, the religious, uh, you know, the, the legal, the religious lawyers and the, and the elders you got the Roman army and you have a temple police. The armed guards are ready to move in quickly and decisively and, and lead Jesus away. And so which one out of the, you know, the Romans wouldn't have known, the Roman guard wouldn't have known which one Jesus was. And so there was a signal was prearranged to mark Jesus out. It was a kiss. You just, you, you just, uh, um, the Bible says when a strong desire has conceived, it brings forth, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it grows up, brings forth death. Death in the sense of no life of God being evident. And that's what was true in this case. You have this betrayal that's really so repulsive. Judas had been close to Jesus for these years, and yet at the end he rejected him. He betrayed him, betrayal by a close friend. The one whom I kiss, he's the one. That was a customary way of saluting a rabbi or a friend, a kiss. I'll kiss him, you seize him, and lead him away under guard. And so Judas, when he arrived, went immediately to Jesus saying, Rabbi, and kissed him. The kiss is a, it's an interesting word that's used because it isn't a little peck on the cheek. It's a fervent kiss like a, a, a lover would give his beloved. Scripture says in Proverbs 27, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. And someone well wrote, the treachery of Judas still staggers us. It does, if you think about it. And then Jesus was seized by this group. Over in, in, in John chapter 18, it gives us some more details. So Jesus, knowing all things that were coming upon him, went forth and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus, the Nazarene. He said to them, I am. Uh, the name I am, that's the Old Testament name. That's God's name in the Old Testament, Yahweh, which means I am. And Jesus responds to them, I am. And Judas also, who was betraying him, was standing with them. So when he said to them, I am, they drew back and fell to the ground. And therefore he again asked them, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus the Nazarene. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. So if you seek me, let these go their way to fulfill the word which he spoke, of those whom you have given me, I lost not one. And then one of the disciples drew his sword. Verse 47, but one of those who stood by drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest and cut off his ear. Uh, John chapter 18, after 
Peter has died tells us it was Peter who drew the sword. And it was Malchus, the guy's, the guy's name. This was, this was the high priest slave who was the victim. And so first you had test time for Judas, and he betrayed Jesus when he was, had the opportunity. Then you have this test time for Peter. And he responds to the situation by wildly swinging his sword. You see, the, the lack of prayer and preparation in the Garden of Gethsemane when he slept instead of prayed and kept watch, uh, the lack of that preparation shows. Now, apparently, Peter was not aiming at his ear. Apparently, Peter was aiming at his head, but Malchus must have sidestepped, and Peter only caught his right ear or his earlobe, as Luke uh, chapter 22 tells us. And if you look at other places, the parallel passages in Matthew and, and Luke, you, you, you realize that Jesus rebuked Peter and he says, Peter, put away your sword. And he also restores Malchus' ear. Those aren't recorded by Mark, but we know they took place. You see, Peter's still trying to carry out his words when he said he would die with Jesus rather than deny him. I will, these other guys, they probably will deny you, Jesus, but that, what you just said, that the sheep will be scattered, that doesn't apply to me. I will not deny you. And his, his actions, they, they were an attempt to do what he thought was right. But it was not the Father's will. He would have found that out if he had spent time with the Father, listening, sharing his heart. And then he wanted the Father's will more than he wanted his own. Reacting by the flesh, Peter endangered the mission of Jesus. Jesus had to die so that our sins could be dealt with, and so we as sinners could be dealt with, and so that sin in the flesh could be dealt with. Jesus had to die. We're going to talk about, when we get to Easter, the necessity of the cross and the necessity of the resurrection. And so he was endangering the mission of Jesus, as well as, you know, man, if they'd have had a Tommy gun during that time, they'd have, they'd have shot them all. All of them, everybody would have, all the disciples. And the, there, there were good intentions, what he was doing there. But it's such a vivid example of the weak flesh at work. Remember Jesus said in the garden, you guys, your spirit is willing, I know that. But your flesh is weak. And it'll always be weak. And it'll never get better. It won't change. And as, unless you learn how to walk in my strength instead of your own, you're always going to mess things up. Verse 48, And Jesus said to them, Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I was with you in the temple teaching and you didn't seize me, but this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. It's test time for Jesus. Remember, Jesus came to this earth not to, not to show us how God would live a human life. That's not his purpose. That wouldn't do us any good. He couldn't be an example for us. He came to show us what a human being, totally dependent on God, looks like in everyday life. And so Jesus was tested too. And Jesus here neither resisted his arrest nor did he flee from, his, from Judas and the soldiers. Strengthened by prayer with the Father, knowing his will, he stood firm. Notice here, when Jesus talks to them, he doesn't protest against his arrest he, he, he protests against its manner. I, am, I, am I like an insurrectionist? I've taught openly in the temple. You've had many opportunities. 
And, and the Lord, even that very week, had, had visited the temple on three consecutive days. And then you read the last part of verse 49, but this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures. The, the, the secret of Jesus being able to stand firm in that situation and accept what was coming to him. Here's the secret of that. He knew that all of this had its place in the plan and purpose of God. If you remember Peter's statement, this is Peter later on after uh, in Acts chapter 2. This man, Jesus, delivered over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. This did not take God unawares. It was not a, a shock to him. He didn't, you know, uh, wring his hands and wonder, oh my, oh my, look what they're doing to my son. You see, Jesus' statement here did not remove the individual's guilt, the soldiers, Judas, but it displayed his confident trust in the Father. And it's a, it's, a, it's a great blessing to be able to discern between the evil choices of men. And we're having a situation in this country this week. In fact, I think it's been for many months, but just this week we've had this, you know, the tragedy down in, in Florida. And, and, and we as Christians need to be able to discern between the evil choices of mankind and the invisible hand of God directing everything for the establishment of his kingdom. God hasn't lost control. And we need to understand that God's at work even when we see these really difficult things. I find it interesting that we were talking about this, Mary Lee and I were talking about it this week and talked about it on Friday morning men's group. And uh, that there was a, a time when Pilate, the Roman governor Pilate, he... he killed some Galileans and they actually took the blood of these Galileans and mixed it with the, with the sacrifices to their pagan gods. And there was another time when a, a wall fell in, 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 and killed 18 individuals, 18 Jewish people. And Jesus really didn't comment a whole lot on the situations. He said, you just be sure that you're ready doesn't mean they were greater sinners because that happened to them. It just means that happened. And you need to be sure that you repent and are ready when maybe something like that happens to you. We don't know that. We don't know what's going to take place. We don't know what our tests are going to consist of. And then they laid hands on Jesus and seized him. There's no charge. There are no rights read. His enemies, they, they thought they owned the night. But even the night was under the control of the Father. And so here we see Jesus faced with a, a moment of choice. And the choice that he made there is, Father, I trust you. And I realize this is the fulfillment of Scripture. Again, I want your will more than I want my own. And so strengthened by prayer, Jesus submitted to the Father's will. He, he voluntarily placed himself in the hands of his captors. It's really interesting because even on the cross, he voluntarily gives up his life. When he dies, it's because he chose to die. Because death is the result of sin. And so when Jesus was tested, he relied on the Father and followed his will. And then you have, in, in verse 50, you have the test time for the disciples. They all left him and fled. Doesn't say too much, does it? You see, all their confidence that Jesus was the Jewish Christ, the one promised in the Old Testament, so, suddenly des deserted them. It was every man for himself. And even Peter, whose initial temptation was to fight, is now giving way to flight. He's, he's running for his life. There was a way out, and so Jesus gave it to him, and man, they took off.
And once again, we ask the question, would I have done the same thing? I, I don't know the answer to that. Because I haven't been in exactly that situation. And so these tests, they, they come, even though they're different for us. Your, your tests, I think God uses these tests. They're, they're, they're especially designed just for, for you. Maybe your family. Even our church. I think the tests that are designed are, are broad or allowed by the Lord. I, I truly believe that they are designed for our growth. And to reveal where we, how we could have prepared. Most of us, most of the time as I look back and when I realize I've failed, I look back and I realize, wow, there I had the opportunity to prepare. I didn't take advantage of that. Said I went into it thinking, well, certainly I can get 60%. And we don't know what would have happened if they had accepted God's way. They, they would have certainly grieved as they saw their Lord being, being uh, uh, bound and and taken away by these hundreds of soldiers. They, they might even have been arrested with Jesus. But they would have stood quietly by their Lord as he was arrested. But remember, Jesus said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. That's what we're seeing here. And so you see this betrayal by Judas. You see he's seized by his enemies. You see he's abandoned by his friends. There's nobody left, humanly speaking. Sometimes aloneness is one of the hardest tests to go through. I think it's tough for kids in school and the peer pressure that's there. Sometimes you need to stand alone and you feel like you're all alone because you are. Sometimes it's that way at work. You might be the only Christian there. Everybody else laughs at the jokes or something that's done meanly to somebody. What's the Father's will? That's what we find out as we study the Scripture. Perhaps you're disappointed with Jesus. He isn't doing things the way you think he should. Perhaps like the disciples, instead of accepting the Father's will, we run from him and his plan, fearing he can't be trusted. Hey, I don't want to be around this, I don't want to be around this Jesus. Remember Peter, when we look at him, um, we're going to find that he, uh, he even denied he even knew Jesus. Perhaps we're afraid to share the name of Jesus. I'll tell you, for what's going on in this world today, and especially what's going on in this country today, Jesus is the answer. There aren't any other answers. It isn't a political party. It isn't a certain person in office. There, there aren't any other answers. Jesus is the answer. And we need to boldly share that. If you've got an answer to something and you don't share the answer with somebody else, that's That's wrong. We might fear what will happen to us if we share the name of Jesus, which is happening to people, Christians today. Ridicule, persecution, it might even lead to death. So you look at Jesus and we see in him the peace of a man who knows he's following the will of the Father and counting on him, depending on him for everything. And then we see the disciples running for their lives, getting as far away from Jesus as they could. The tests are going to come to reveal what we will, how we will, what we've learned or what we should learn. And then you have these two verses that are only mentioned in the Gospel of Mark. And there was a young man who was following him wearing nothing but a linen sheet over his naked body. And they seized him, but he pulled free of the linen sheet and escaped naked. It's test time for a young man that we don't even know who he is. 
A linen outer garment was an expensive material worn only by the rich. The writer of this gospel, his name is Mark, he was the son of rich parents, at least his mother was rich. The gospel of Mark is the only one which, which includes this incident, and, and some people think uh, this was the writer, Mark, just kind of putting his, you know, didn't put his name, but he just kind of puts himself in the picture here. You see, was he the man carrying the water that led them to the upper room so that they could prepare it, the apostles for, for Jesus and the apostles? Was he in the upper room in his parents' house, or maybe he had gone to sleep, and when he heard Jesus and the others leave, did he, did he leap out of bed and wrap himself in this linen sheet and follow Jesus to the garden? Who else, you know, really, who else would have known such details and the linen sheet and the naked body? And someone wrote, it is a glorious, fascinating, and ultimately unprovable assumption. <laughs> Speculation. But whoever this young man was, these soldiers seized him too. And, and this young man runs for his life. He ran away. And how will we respond when the unthinkable occurs and we're asked to drink the cup that Jesus drank? He asked, he asked James and John, are, are you able to drink the cup that I drink? And they both said yes. Here they had the opportunity and they ran for their lives. And so Jesus was left absolutely alone to face his accusers. He was cut adrift from all human support. He, he goes to these trials all alone. Trials before you know, the former high priest and then the high priest in the Sanhedrin and then, you know, and then before Pilate and then before Herod. He goes alone, all alone. Only his father's with him. And his father was enough. So, Judas, um, Perhaps his affection for Jesus was revealed when he finally realizes the results of his betrayal. He, he actually commits suicide. But at his moment of choice, he, he, he made the choice to betray Jesus. That was a choice that he made. You look at the Apostle Peter and you realize later on he would realize God's gift of mercy and go on to become this great proclaimer of the grace that he had experienced that, wow, oh, this Jesus saved me. But at his moment of choice at this time when he's tested in this particular area, he makes the choice to swing the sword and then flee and then later deny Jesus three times. And then you have the disciples who would later proclaim the name of Jesus everywhere, but they still made the choice that night to flee. The young man, if he was Mark, he would later write a gospel with his name, but he still made the choice to slip out of his garment and run for his life too. And then you have test time for you and me, and I realize some of you are going through things that I hope I never have to face, to be very honest. That's designed to help you understand. It isn't, it isn't for God. He already knows where you, what needs to be. And I think that's one of the reasons he allows some of these tests or brings some of these tests is he knows what, what, what is required to show us our need for him. Or sometimes he shows us that we're doing it right. And we're just so grateful. Thank you, God, for working in me and through me in that way. Obviously, that's of you. Thank you. Thanks for revealing that. And Jesus would die for every one of these individuals, including us, within about, if it's after midnight, it would be within about 14 or 15 hours. He would be dead on the cross in our place for our sins. On your handout, I have a conclusion there. I, I realize I didn't have anything for you to fill in today, so sorry to disappoint those of you who love to fill in the blanks. 
I hope you took notes, though. By the way, we do, you know, I usually have about 25 copies of my notes, if you uh, would ever like to take those home with you. In what way do you realize your human spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak? Boy, we've got to come to that place. We've got to come to the place of weakness, inadequacy, understanding that God does not hold us accountable for living the Christian life. He's the only one capable of living that kind of life, but he's willing to live his life in us and through us. And in order for us to come to the place of trusting our Lord, we have to realize that we are not adequate in ourselves. We are weak. Our flesh is weak. And so in what way do you realize your human spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak? And please understand God's answer for our willing spirits and weak flesh is prayer. Spending time with him, sharing, listening, accepting. Not what I will, but what you will. Another answer for our willing spirits but weak flesh is the Holy Spirit who, who indwells, who's taken up residence in every Christian's body. Every Christian. In fact, the Bible makes it very clear. If you don't have the Holy Spirit in your life, and your body, you are not a Christian. And so it's really important to understand that. So prayer, spending time with Jesus, sitting at his feet and listening, that's the, that's the best thing. In fact, it's the necessary thing. That's the way to prepare. The challenge of faith, as I go on in the handout, is to believe that God is with you. It seems like God, I imagine it, in terms of feelings, I imagine it felt like the Father had deserted him at that time because everybody else had. But the Father hadn't deserted his Son, and the Father doesn't desert us. God is with us, and we need to practice his presence. The challenge of faith is to believe that he loves you. Sometimes it doesn't feel like you love me, God, when, what's, when you're allowing what's going on in my life or even doing what's going on in my life. That doesn't feel like love to me, but I realize that you do love me, and the place you proved that ultimately is on a cross where Jesus, your son, died in my place. God loves us, and he wants the best for you. He doesn't want the worst for you. You know, a teacher should not give a test to, to flunk the student. A teacher should give a test so that, so that the teacher can learn what the kids apparently aren't getting or to show that the student that they aren't preparing as they could. He want, God wants the best for us. And the challenge of faith is to believe that he's in control. He's in control. He hasn't lost control. He's not wringing his hands and wondering what to do. And so the challenge of faith is to believe all those things when you find yourself in a place like Gethsemane where the darkness is closing in. And don't fight and don't flee. Instead, watch and pray so that you, may, so that you won't give in to that temptation to fight or flee. As Jesus says, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And so commit ourselves to and our ways to our Father, fully accepting his will, operating in his strength. And so the question becomes, how do these truths need to take place in your life? In other words, for what you're going through right now, how are you doing? And I shared with somebody this morning, they asked how I was doing. I said, pretty well right now. We're not really going through any real hard tests. And I said, but don't start praying that we will. <laughs> In other words, this is preparation time. If you're not going through a tough test right now, and God revealing what, where you're resting in him and where you aren't, then this is preparation time. Don't, don't waste it. Don't go to sleep. At the front after every service, we have a couple of people up here who will pray with you. We want to do that. We want people to pray. 
Maybe you don't even, maybe you just need to share, I just need prayer. Maybe you don't even want to share the details. That's okay. But just, it's so good to have somebody else praying for you. It's a reason for our prayer chain. I hope, you, I hope you're on it. I hope you take advantage of it. If you aren't on it, please contact uh, Lisa and, at the church here and let her know that uh, you want to be on the prayer chain because that way you not only can express some of your prayer requests, but you can pray for others who are going through really difficult times. And don't forget Cafe Connection. It's over there in the other building. If you can brave the wind, go over there and grab a cup of coffee or some donut holes and uh, maybe make yourself friendly. Talk to somebody else. Say, how you doing in your life? And if somebody asks you that, be honest with them. You know, don't tell all the grisly details. Just say, I, I, I'm in need of prayer right now. And maybe you could just pray together right then. So, Lord, we thank you for our time in your word. The truth of it is just powerful. Um, I, I pray. I, so I read through the prayer chain, and I'm aware of many situations in life that people are going through. I, I, I pray for those individuals. Um, I pray that they will learn from those where they're resting in you and where they're not. And I pray that if there's a calm right now, that we are very thankful for that, but realize that as we continue to grow in you, that the tests are going to continue to come, and again, they will probably be harder. I don't find that I'm really tested on things that I learned maybe my first year of growth. I'm tested on where I am right now. Thank you for... for because if I had had the tests I'm having now, early in my Christian life, it would have destroyed me. Absolutely destroyed me. But you, kindly, um, are working so that I will continue to grow up in you. And that's true for our church, every, in, every Christian here. If there's anyone here this morning who doesn't know Jesus, I pray that they would see that he is the solution. That we can only respond as he did in the midst of times like, uh, in the midst of a really most difficult test, we can only respond by trusting you and finding answers in your word and seeking your will for our lives. Thanks for our time together. We pray these things in our Lord Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.